flip over to chapter 4 of Acts. We see a similar story portrayed uh, a little deeper in the timeline. Chapter 4, verse 32. Now the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul, and one said that any of these things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. And with great power, the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as were owners of lands or houses sold them and bought the proceeds of what was sold, and laid it at the apostles' feet, and was distributed to each as any had need. Again, we see an example of them doing a monetary thing. But what I want you to look back on is where it talks about their oneness, their togetherness, their shared mentality, their shared thought. That it wasn't just this, just for them, whatever it was they gathered. It's not just for us, this building that brings us together. But there is something more and something greater. As I've started covering with the teens uh, on Wednesday and today, We're talking about the gospel. That is the story of Christ, the story of our salvation that brings us together, that unifies us. And that is a a thing that cannot be broken. As much as Christ can't be pulled away from us, we should not be pulled away from each other. For as much as we are together with Christ, we are together with each other. When you think about a burden, the definition just plainly being a heavy load How much easier is it to bear when you're not holding it by yourself? Ashley and I started moving, and we did the smart thing, small boxes, right? You don't want to do the big boxes. Might as well do a few small trips because the big boxes are what kill you at the end of the night. But there's some things that we cannot move by ourselves. There's some things we would not be able to move by ourselves. There's some things in your life that you've tried to go through on your own, and you could not move them by yourself. That mountain just stayed there. But how much easier was it, or maybe for a different thing, when you shared that with other believers, when you shared that in prayer with your God, when you shared that with somebody close to you, when you shared that with another family member? The burden gets a little lighter. It gets a little easier. You have four hands under that box instead of just two. Sometimes it's not that it's heavy, it's just that it's awkward. It's that it's bulky. That sometimes it's easier when you have multiple people to surround it and help you navigate it and angle it and get it through. What I want us to see from the, from the first century church today, some of the first churches today, is that they were so one that there was no difference between them. They allowed themselves to become like each other. They allowed themselves to help one another. They allowed themselves to not see a difference in elevation, but they supported one another. Look back at Galatians with me. And you might want to mark it, because we are going to flip a little bit. So make sure you mark Galatians. Looking back at verse 3. For if anyone thinks he is something when he is nothing, he deceives himself. But let each one test his own work, and then his reason to boast will be in himself alone and not in the neighbor. For each will have to bear his own load. What Paul is wanting us to see here is that trying to go it by yourself will bring about your own destruction. Trying to just kind of plow through or bulldoze your way through things will bring about your own pain. It will bring about your own destruction. We already know, most of us here being believing Christians, we know that how important it is for us to to align ourselves with Christ, to, to yoke ourselves with Christ, to allow him to make the change within us, to allow him to do the work within us. But there's things here in this life that the purpose of the church, the reason he gave it to us, was so that we didn't have to do certain things alone. That we didn't have to be a a lone ranger or a lone wolf. He gave us family. 
Now the question is, do we use it? Pride is a monster. And pride will get you every time. If you allow your pride to keep you from reaching out, if you allow your pride to keep you from, from holding out your hand for someone to walk next to you, if you allow the pride of whatever it is, and, and, and I'm not just talking to financial needs, I'm talking in your own sin as well, that you don't want people to know, that you want to stay the beacon, the, the painted white fence that everyone sees you as, that will destroy you. That pride is always going to find you and it is always going to break you. Galatians 3, 6, 3 through 5. Trying to do it by yourself, your flesh will bring you to corruption. So humble yourself. Bring yourself to a point that you don't allow... Uh, Satan to come in and to plant fear in your life and to convince you that people won't love you the same. Don't allow Satan to come in and put fear in your life to convince you that you're not going to be good enough for God if this gets out. Don't allow Satan to come in and put any sort of lie in your head that is going to change the purpose of what God gave us family for. Because that, that's just, that's not like God. That's against God. Verse 6. One who is taught the word must share all good things with the one who teaches. Now, I could really put a good plug in here for you to, you know, bless back upon me because I'm teaching you right now. But this isn't the purpose of this. The purpose of this part is saying those who have received are blessed enough to give. Those that have been taught the word are blessed enough to give it back. If anything, it's a humbling moment to say, even as your teacher, you're still going to have to teach me. I tell the kids all the time, I have learned more. I've learned so much more when I started working with kids about my faith, about Christianity, about the word of God, than before I ever started working with them. You teach us. But look at it in the, in the context of burdens. Some of us here are walking with our backs straight. It's a good time right now. There's not too much hindering us. There's not too much stopping us. There's not too much holding us back. We're not in that defensive position trying to hold everything. We're good. We're okay. But there are some sitting in here, your back's hurt. Your arms are weak. Your legs are tired. And you don't know how much more you can do. My challenge to you in all of this, let us know. I can't, I can't give back. I can't give to you. I can't get in that defensive position with you if I don't know. So the big thing is not just being told to give back, but some of us may, to be, may need to hear, allow people to give back. Allow people to be down in the dirt with you. Allow people to get in the mud. Allow people to get sweaty in that defensive position. Allow people to pray with you. Allow people to read scripture with you. Allow people to just sit with you when you don't know what else to do or what else to say. Allow people to serve you. Because that is what they were doing. That is what things looked like back then. Even by the time he's writing to the Galatian church, they're having to be reminded of this. How much so do we need to be reminded 2,000 years later that it's not about, it's not just all about what people can see. So much of it is about what people can't see. Look at Acts chapter 20. We will be coming back here, so be sure you mark it. Acts chapter 20. Verse 
Verse 35. In all things I have shown you that by working hard in this way, we must help the weak and remember the words of the Lord Jesus, how he himself said, it is more blessed to give than to receive. I was talking to somebody the other day who's been going through a hard time, and we've had this conversation several times. And, and this person loves to give. This person loves to, uh, to give back to people, to, to do whatever they can to, uh, to help somebody. But they themselves are now in a situation that they can't like they used to. And one of the, the most profound statements I've, I've heard in a while and something that, that has walked with me since then is they said, I don't have the opportunity to give. I don't have the opportunity to bless others. You're taking away my opportunity to be blessed. And that's, that's how they view this hardship right now, is they can't serve like they used to serve. They can't do like they used to do. And as scripture says, it is better to give than receive. Like, how awesome is it when at Christmas time you see your child light up because you got them that gift that they've been asking for? How exciting is it when you have, you know, even if it's a clunker sitting in the driveway and your 16-year-old goes out and is like, yes! Like, you're just sitting there going, ah, oh, yeah. Like, I stole that moment from my parents. They gave me a license plate in a box, and I was like, what's this? Like, I, I had no clue. I was slow. Giving is great. Giving is better. But receiving, and this is what I've always told uh, a lot of the college kids that have graduated out of my studies and my time. I'll go have lunch with them. They're like, oh, no, let me pay for you. You always paid for me growing up. And I was like, you're in college. You have no money. And what I, <laughs> that was kind of the mean part. But the, the loving part is I said, let me love you. Let me show my love for you. Let me show my appreciation for you. Let me show you, just with this small act, what, what I can do. Because I don't have much. I can't, I can't pay off your student loans, but I, I can buy you lunch. Let me love you. Finishing up Galatians here. Verses 7 through 10. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked, for whatever one sows, that will he also reap. For the one who sows to his own flesh will from the flesh reap corruption, but the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. And let us not grow weary of doing good, for in due season we will reap. If we do not give up, so then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, and especially to those or of the household of faith. Verses 7 and 8 is, is um, what you do is what you get. What you reap is what you sow. I mean, how, <laughs> how many times has that been used in parenting? Well, you hit your brother first, so you had it coming. But that's so, that, that is a lesson in, in Scripture. That is a lesson in life. That is a lesson in faith. That whatever we're out here doing, whatever out here we're cultivating, we're working on, that is what we're going to get back. And the same mindset, that which we ignore, that which we put down, that which we refuse to help. What if that is what's put back on us? Everybody has their own beliefs on what to do when they are approached by a homeless person. And I'm going to say first off, there, I don't believe there's a right way and I don't know that there's a wrong way because I understand every side of the discussion and the argument. But it's verses like these that make it really hard for me just to walk past. And that's my conviction. It doesn't have to be yours. Please don't hear that. But the way this verse ends, especially the household of faith... It convicts me even more when I see people around me that are in need. When I have people around me that are struggling. When I have people around me that don't know what tomorrow looks like because they just don't know anymore. A 
if nothing else, when I die, I really hope people just say he tried. You know, that's, to me, that's kind of like the best thing somebody could say about you is like, maybe he didn't always get it right because who does, but at least he tried. At least he tried to give back. At least he tried to give a smile. At least he tried to, to give that encouraging word. Going into verse 9, the idea here is to keep going, to, don't, to not give up. It's so easy to get caught up in what the world does. It's so, so easy to get caught up in people telling you no. It is so easy to get caught up in rejection. It is so easy to get caught up in people shutting you down. It is so easy to get caught up in these things. But what we see here is keep trying, keep going. God someday will bless you. It may not be today and it may not be tomorrow and it may not be for another 80 years when you're sitting up at heaven with him and he's going, isn't this nice? But keep going. I know you're tired. I know your back hurts. I know your arms are weak and your legs are about to give out. But keep going. It's worth it. It's not just worth it for your eternity, but it's worth it to the person sitting next to you who just needed your help, who needed your smile, who needed whatever gift you've been given. In verse 10, do good to all, but especially the house of faith. This is echoed again in 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 8. That yes, we are here to serve. We are here to be like Christ. And Christ didn't just focus on the Jews. He focused on the Jews and the Gentiles. So he was out there and he was helping everybody. And I get that. And we see that. And we know that. But there's also an importance to to taking care of, of this. There's an importance of taking care of our relatives, of our own people, of our own family. Because at the end of the day, we are only as strong as our weakest member. We are only as strong as the person who is struggling the most. We are only as strong as the person who is under the biggest burden. So we need to prop them up. We need to lift them up. We need to gather around them. We need to get underneath with them. And we need to make sure that we're all holding whatever it is we can hold. Whatever it is your gift is. Your blessing is. Your heart is. Matthew 25, verse 35. Matthew 25, verse Read with me. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. And I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. And I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you clothed me. And I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then all the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you, or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, Truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. At the end of the day, guys, we're not serving Elizabeth. We're not, we're not serving Stephen. Because the day that you entered that water, you started carrying the Holy Spirit. God lives inside of you. Not only that, but even a non-believer was created in God's image. Even a non-believer who's sitting out there in a homeless shelter was created in God's image. But how much more the person sitting next to us that is struggling with sin, that is struggling with grief, that is struggling with poverty, which is struggling with whatever... In his image and with his spirit. You're serving him. Second Thessalonians 3.10. I know I'm giving your fingers a workout today, guys. But 
Thank you for holding on. Second Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 10. It says, let them also be tested first and let them serve as deacons if... I don't think this is the verse I wanted. Let's try 1 Thessalonians. For that, 1 Thessalonians chapter 3. For that indeed is what you are doing, all the brothers throughout Macedonia. But we urge you, brothers, to do this more and more. Well, I don't know what verse I was looking for for y'all. But I have the thought I wanted. What I had written down was no work. Man, I really wish I could find this one. Anybody know? Shout it out. Um, oh, thanks, guys. Y'all rock. Second Thessalonians 3.10. I was in Timothy. Very different. Same author. Very different. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Ladies, keep us straight up here. Second Thessalonians 3.10. Get the sweat on my. For even when we were with you, we would give you this command. If anyone is not willing to work, let him not eat. I wanted to make sure to include this in here. Because I think a lot of times we get so focused on it's just a handout. It's just this. It's just that. The thing of it is, guys, that's not true. If somebody's not willing to walk still alongside you, if they're just like, here's my burden. Thanks. That's not what the scripture's talking about. That's not what God's talking about. The purpose of sharing burden is we're all still holding on to it. We're all still walking and going. So don't think that you have to give to somebody that's not grateful, that's not willing to continue walking with you, that's not willing to to be the one standing next to you holding up their burden. But be very mindful that the definition of work is very different. Some people, some people just can't. So let's look at the situation. How can we best assess? How can we best get them back on their feet? How can we best get them going? That's why, again, money's not always the issue. Sometimes teaching a skill, teaching... Um, a trade to go out and make money or teaching something to manage money or teaching anything to help them get back on their feet can be a greater good than just handing them the $20. But for sometimes for some people, the $20, they just need to keep the lights on. They just need to keep going. Sometimes it has nothing to do with the skills or the knowledge they have. They're just down on their luck. Thing after thing after thing is hitting and there's just no way of getting your head above water. So in all this today, please don't hear me preaching that you have to give to every cause because some causes, even scripture will say, they're not worth giving to. If they're not willing to help work, they don't get to eat. But if they're working and they're working beside you and they're still holding up that burden with you, give. Ephesians 4.28, of what it means and what it looks like to, to work and to serve along your own family. It's still this further knowledge of, of what do we have to give. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 28. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands, so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. The coolest thing to me is that God believes so much that he put in Paul's heart to write that even a thief can become somebody who works hard and gives. That hearts can be changed, that hearts can be melted, that hearts can be molded and shaped back into the image of God, back into the image of our Father. Through the sacrifice of our Savior and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. People can change. You can change. We just got to let you. We just got to give you opportunity. We just got to give you knowledge. We got to give you know-how. When I first started my, my series with y'all on, um, on family, I used this verse from Hebrews 10. 
You don't have to turn there because I really want you, I want you to listen to it. It's chapter 10, verse 24. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. How beautiful is that? We don't, we don't, I mean, we do, we do come here because there's things that, that we have examples of that we play out and we watch play out. But even in those, in all that we do, in the singing, in the Lord's Supper, in the praying, in the listening to me, it's not for anything but for this, to encourage one another in that same goal, to help one another, to stir up in one another things that we see lacking, things that we see missing. That both those being taught give back to the teacher and we're all working and doing this together. So my conclusion, my so what, my what does all of this mean? As I first want all of us in here to assess the talents and gifts that we have. What is it that you're great at? Maybe you are just the world's best sewer and you can just whip out some clothes or you can whip out some stitching. Clearly, I don't sew because I don't know all the options, but you do. Some of you in here are great cooks. And we have loved having you bless us with that on Wednesdays and Sundays as a youth group. And I know you gather together and you help those that are in need. You help those that have lost. You help those that are sick. But for some of us in here, maybe that's you too. I'm asking you to jump in. Maybe you are a world-class mechanic. Maybe you can come in and do some nice home repairs. I bet there's some people in this congregation that could need that, that could use that. But some of us in here are just blessed. We have excess. We have things to give. If that's you, then, then, then consider that. That's all I'm asking. Sacrifice a little. So someone may have a lot. To the poorest person, $20 is a lot. To the richest man, that's chump change. It's things for us to consider. But also, I have a message for those of you that are in need, that we don't know about, that we haven't seen. Open up. Let us in. Let us love you. Let us take care of you. I understand that it could be embarrassing. I understand that it could be shameful. I understand that the world has put these things into our minds. But I'm telling you today that that's not what God intended. That's not what Christ intended. He wanted us to hold one another. He wanted us to prop each other up. He wanted us to encourage one another. In this, I think about the lame man that they dropped in through the ceiling to see Jesus. If this lame man didn't have those friends, he just stayed cooped up in his house and nobody knew to ever do anything, who knows what would have been the fate of that lame man. But instead, he had people. He surrounded himself with people. He allowed people to know about what was going on in his life. And what those people did is crazy. They come walking in and they see these men standing at the doors back there and like, oh, we can't get in. What are we going to do? Guess we'll go home. Bye, guys. Sorry you didn't get to meet Jesus. No, they somehow drug this dude onto the roof. This, this lame, paralyzed guy got him up on this roof, broke through this roof, and then proceeded to lower him down in front of Jesus. Now, I don't know at what point the crowd started realizing somebody's coming through the ceiling. I don't know at what point Jesus had to stop and just be like, I don't know, because y'all would react to that. So I'm sure they did too. And he's just like, oh, what's this? But the determination of those friends, the determination of people that love them, I want to challenge all of you today, if whatever burden is in your life, whether it be financial, whether it be spiritual, whether it be whatever, a sin, let us in. Let us love you. Let us help. In that, the challenge is to bring those two together. It doesn't always have to be public. I tell people all the time that, and 
this may get me in trouble. Sorry if it does. I don't think every, every sin right away has to be brought to this front pew. Sometimes things need to be a one-on-one. Sometimes things need to be settled brother to brother. Sometimes things need to be walked a little bit before you bring a whole crowd of people into it. And I get that and understand that. I believe that there are private matters that need to be tended to. I hope someday you're, you use your story enough to come up front and to, to share with us and to speak in front of others of how God came in and changed your life. But I understand private needs. I understand private giving. I understand private walking with one another, okay? So I know I'm not going to see all the, all the fruits of, of the sermon. I know I'm not going to see all the fruits of what God's doing in this congregation. But I do want to challenge all of us to find a way. Privately, publicly. I mean, if, you're, if you show up one day and you're doing something up here at the building, I guess I'm going to see it. But find a way to give. So we started that benevolent fund. It currently, well, it started with $5,000. Um, right now, the youth group's keeping back the rest of that that was made just to see how summer goes, and then we may give the rest of that over. Because really, after summer, we're, we're pretty set. That's, that's awesome, guys. That's, that's $5,000 that's going to bless people. It's going to help people. And I know that for some of you, maybe the days of using your talents are, are getting past you. For some of you, the days of using your gifts, you're not able to go out, and your backs aren't as strong, and your legs aren't as strong, and you're not able to do as much. And if, and if giving financially is your thing... Cool. Every first Sunday of the month, starting in June, June 2nd, we're going to have a second plate. And everything from that second plate is going to go straight to this benevolent fund to help people in this family. To help people here that are struggling, that need help. That way, if, if something happens and the world falls upon you and you can't pay your light bill one month, we have the means to help. And I I know I've talked to the elders and Michael, and I know that some of you, you have been quick to step up. You've been quick to give in. But I want all of us to have the opportunity to give even a penny if that's what we can give. To give $100 if that's what we can give. Whatever it is, the sacrifice of our little could be a blessing of a lot to someone else. So I want you all to know that opportunity is there. But there's way much more than money that you can do. So what that means is if you're in need, let us know. If you have gifts and means, let us know that too. I'm sure the elders would love to know what talents you have, what you're willing to do. So when people do go to them, when people do go talk to them, which, which we should, that's what they're here for, to shepherd us. They know what, how deep their, their means are. And they can pair you up and they can connect y'all. And no one has to know but the two of you and whichever elder you went to. But don't let shame win. Don't let pride win. To our non-family members, maybe you're a guest here, maybe you're a non-believer here, uh, whatever the situation or the case may be, what I want you to hear today is how cool this family sounds. I want you to hear today, not necessarily this family, but the family of God. The fact that you have a family to lean on. The fact that you don't have to go things alone. The fact when life gets hard, even if you're the richest person on earth, you still have somebody to sit with you and to cry with you when you're sad. I hope you hear about a God that brings us together. A Christ that saved us. A spirit that lives within us that makes us never alone. If you're intrigued by that, If you want to be a part of that, we can make that happen. If you want to study more about that, we can make that happen too. If you're a believer and you're just, I I just, I need a refresher course. I just need some, some time. I just need like a spiritual hug. Come on down. But I hope all of us today, whether we're a believer or not, we either dedicate ourselves to be, or we dedicate more of ourselves to be. I love you all. Y'all are an amazing congregation, an amazing group of people. 
And I hope you didn't hear this today as a shaming. I, I want this today to be a blessing and an uplift and us be such a bright light in the South Dallas area that people don't even know what to do with us. That people start coming in droves through these doors to know what changed us, what makes us different.